three, two, one. Finding success on one career path is hard enough, but for some, having everything is never quite enough. Our guest today, Chika Nuobi, founder of Decacon, is a rare breed that IPO'd his first tech venture in Nigeria and has since gone on to become one of the region's most active angel investors. And now, with recently launched Decacon, the technology and training development platform, he seeks to do it again. We begin our conversation discussing his early days navigating the introduction of cell phones in Nigeria with MTech and scaling his business across 16 African countries. He then shares the lessons he learned angel investing and striking it big with Jobberman, Africa's largest job classified portal. We end with a discussion of his ambitious efforts of turning Nigeria into a top 10 technology service exporter in the next 10 years. This episode is perfect for any investor or founder that wants to scale their business across Africa's borders or learn how to spot founders that will build Africa's next big thing. After the show, check out our show notes at VentureTheWorld.com for more information about Chica and our other guests. Our host for this episode is Mark Fleming and myself, Chinadu Anekwe. We are excited to finally have uh, Chika Nwobi on the podcast today. You are essentially the king of African digital distribution. Chika has been part of three notable African exits, one with MTech as a Nigerian-based mobile marketing value-added service provider that expanded to 16 countries across Africa with over 150 employees before exiting on the Nigerian Stock Exchange to his investments in the online car classified platform, Checky and Africa's largest online job portal, Jobberman, both of which have exited. He is now building Decacon, a software institute and development firm with the goal of launching Nigeria into a top 10 destination for software development in 10 years, and continues to invest out of L5 Labs, his family office and investment company incubation platform. Chika, welcome to Venture the World. Welcome. <laughs> thanks, thanks, thanks. Great to be here. Yeah, very good to have you. So you pretty much came of an age in African tech sector prior to the advent of social media. So I don't believe your story has been fully told or it hasn't been told in full enough, at least for me. And you've come full circle from an entrepreneur with an exit to an angel to now in VC with an exit, now back to being an entrepreneur. Quite the journey. So my first question for this podcast is going to be the hardest one. When are you writing a book? And two, can you explain what you're going to write in that book about coming out of those early days? (laughs) Uh, Yeah, thanks. No, I I should write a book. I think a couple of people have said that to me. I think you feel like you haven't done enough. or I feel like let's do the let the next one be big enough. Mm -hmm. Then it'll be interesting enough for people to want to read. I believe and I hope. Then I'm going to be big enough and then we'll write a book. I keep finding like really interesting things, things that I'm really passionate about. And they have gone more so than uh, uh, anything else I've ever done in my life. These days, um, uh, really caught up in what's in front. When I think back to 20 years ago, I was a year out of college. I went to college in Tennessee during the years when the internet from 96 to 2000, when the internet became a thing, I was really fascinated by just the ability to go on the internet and learn whatever I wanted to learn. And found on the internet that there was some people in Silicon Valley, young people like myself that were like using the existence of the internet to do big businesses, solving big problems, uh, transforming their lives and creating more wealth. And for me, I just thought I needed to take that back to Nigeria. Um, I needed it to go and make that a possibility. Um, and this is when you were in Tennessee? This is when I was in Tennessee. I went to East Tennessee State University in a small town in Johnson City. I did a lot of internships, work. I think the most interesting point was the time when I had an internship at Sprint as a software developer, and they had a major internet. It was like on the backbone of the internet. And I, and I would like, I refused to go home. I would be in the office in the night and morning. Just, yeah, it was amazing. And I think that maybe that was a foreshadowing of my fascination with just the internet and telcos and ability to um, be a neighbor um, for 
for people to build things, to learn things, to start things, to build things. I think that's a really interesting point around that was the time when T1 connections at colleges and, and actually in offices were the, the prime way for people to actually have very strong enterprise scale connections and Absolutely. We're leveraging that to learn. Okay. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, I spent one year working for a startup in America and it was a startup. I chose a company that was making internet available on mobile phones. At the time, there was a technology called WAP was brand new. And I got, you know, I got a lot from that experience. I got startup experience. I got um, confidence of launching enterprise products um, all in one year, just because we it was so new. And within a year, I moved back to Nigeria. I was 22 at the time, and I started at MTech. And, you know, I think back, I think, I think of two things. One was like, I was like, insanely confident to have moved back for just a year out of um, college. Most people who move to America from Nigeria at least want to like have a green card so they can go back whenever they want. And the company I was working for was ready to do that. But um, so I was insanely confident. I was certain I was going to build a really big business. Absolutely certain. I thought it was going to be easy. I thought I was going to transform, you know, uh, Nigeria. And I was also insanely, like unbelievably lucky it turns out because the timing was great. Mobile networks were just getting rolled out. They had tried to do it like four or five times and it had never worked. And this time it worked. The licenses were done. Serious players came in. And then I happened to meet, you know, to, to get investors that were just amazing in the sense that I didn't have to like, you know, as a young 22 year old, I didn't have to like do so much pitching angels in Nigeria at the time. Um, and so just got introduced to these three people and they invested in not just money, but they really helped make uh, introductions, made introductions to MTN. At the time when MTN hadn't even started their network, MTN is now the largest telco in Africa. At the time, they were big in South Africa and then Nigeria, I think, was one of the first other countries. And that was the time it was crazy because I said to MTN, hey, look, I can make internet available on mobile phone. And they were like, if you can do it, then do it. We'll share the revenue with you. And I got access to, to basically do whatever I wanted on the MTN network. It was so early. So that was very lucky. But then I think the, the third, you know, uh, the second part of the luck was just still to do with these my investors, but how supportive they were. Because it turned out that I was able to build an amazing team and we were able to get the stuff working technically, but it was a huge commercial failure. It was way too early. The network just couldn't support it. And we should have gone out of business. We ran out of money after a year. And my team stuck with me, working in a way that we're not being paid. But, but my investors, back to my investors, they, they, they stuck with me. They just kept encouraging me and telling me, figure it out. They had my back. And so that was very lucky. And I, certainly without that type of confidence and support, I would have shut the company down. But in the end, we were able to find other things to do. Because we had impressed the telco technically, then they said, look, whatever else you want to do on the network, figure stuff out. And we, we started to do things that were not as impactful, not, not as important as the internet, but uh, we made money from ringtones and SMS news and all of that type of thing that became the value added services industry. It wasn't all fun and games. We built out several firsts. We built like the first mobile banking application in uh, Nigeria for the bank. Three, we did the first video on mobile phones. We licensed the 2006 World Cup for Africa and used that as the launch pad to roll out across six African countries at the same time. I think just all in all, that's luck of the investors and the team that I had, young people right all out of college in Nigeria, and then just the confidence that starting with my confidence out of ignorance, but then supported by confidence that, you know, was really translated from my investors. And then my team started to have that confidence. And when I would be down, they would pick me up. It was interesting, like most of them now, like I found that like CEOs and run like really successful companies. So you transitioned to Nigeria, you transitioned when you were running MTech to pivot to value added services after your grand vision changed. How did you learn to transition to the next thing? What helped you make those decisions when you were making those transitions? Was it people? Was it just overall looking at the landscape? Yeah, well, I think both. I think Well, the first one was desperation, right? The first one was like, 
like pivot or die, like literally, you're already dead. Like it's just, you have like one life left and pick something that's going to work. I would not have picked ringtones if I had a lot of money in the bank. I would have tried to do something more serious and impactful. Like it was going to work. I saw like in England, South Africa, it was making money and we needed to make money. And I think when you don't have many options there, you can also like move with a lot of conviction when you're back against the wall. So that's a special case. I think subsequently, it gets harder when there's a lot of options, right? When you now have money. So around the time when we decided to like expand out into Africa, we had an option. We could have stayed in Nigeria and expanded into other types of businesses, other types of tech businesses. The thing about mobile at the time was mobile was a gateway to apps and that was the way that people were accessing the internet. So we could have said, let's stay in Nigeria and do other things. But then I thought, I just figured that Nigeria was a big market. We had done a very good job in Nigeria. We, Nigeria had the large telco group. So just thinking about, first of a strategy standpoint, the risk and consolidation our wins. Because the key thing was to enter another market, you needed to have a relationship with the telco carrier. And because Nigeria had MTN and Detail, who were in multiple markets, then and Nigeria was one of the biggest in their groups, then I just, I figured that it would be less risky. And so a higher return because, you know, the markets and investors and just people just tend to view a company that is in multiple countries as more valuable than a company that is in one country. So it was a higher return by being in more countries and less risk because it was the business that we were like the best in Nigeria. We figured we could be the best in Africa. So the point I'm trying to make is that that is the, somebody else might have gone about it a different way, come up with a different outcome that would have also been right for them. But just looking back at that decision and most of the other decisions that I try to make about what businesses to go into or strategic decisions, just being disciplined to be structured, like frameworks that you can just go online and look at frameworks to help make decisions uh, and then just follow the framework and it gives confidence in the decision making, which then helps with the execution. And I think related to that, talking to people, just putting a little bit of time into investing some time and money into like research. And by research, talking to people who are already doing it and before researching like the two or three options, investing a little bit of time and money in that helps with, again, with the confidence of the decision. And because I feel like execution really contributes to the results far more than the correctness of the decision. Just because if, if you're really smart or if you if have some success, we can assume that you have some smartness and then most times your two or three options are probably good options anyway. It's really around picking the best of the good options. And so then the confidence in the decision-making and the process, especially if there's a team and investors involved, then being able to see that there was like a good you know, process that led to it helps everybody with execution. Okay. So we know that you've transitioned to Decagon into EdTech. But we want to get to the evolution of digital distribution in Africa as well, because you've been at very critical phases at the advent of mobile services and then mobile internet and the different phases of your career. What are the technology or behavioral trends that have caused Africa's, or at least in most of the markets you've operated, the shifts in digital distribution? Yeah, the first thing that comes to mind is enabling tech becoming widespread. Uh, widely available. That's the obvious enabler of behavioral shifts. Okay, so mobile became widely available. Then people started accessing ringtones in the first instance, and then videos and so on. And that's one way to look at it. But I think perhaps even more importantly is actually the entrepreneur emerging. So the entrepreneur who has the capacity and capability and commitment to push a particular new trend I'll give you a couple of examples that I'm personally involved in, one from the past, one from now, and maybe one that doesn't concern me. So if you think about distribution of music, ringtones. So I launched the first ringtone service. What that means is that the first time that a musician in Nigeria made money from a digital platform was me and my team that made it happen. To make it happen, though, the mobile phones were there for about three years before we did the ringtones. And when we tried the legal framework, MTN said, 
we don't know a big company from a legal standpoint, the rights and all that stuff, how is that going to work? So we can't do it. And that's why they hadn't done it for two years or three years that they had been in Nigeria. But then I was like, okay, well, this is not going to stop me. And we went and we researched from America, England, and tried to figure out how can we have a legal, transparent way to pay money for royalties. So, so the technology was there for three years. And in other parts of the world, royalties had been working, but royalties were not working in Nigeria. And if that was not in place, this business could not happen. So a couple long story short, we figured it out. We went to this, there was this little office somewhere in the market somewhere. There was this company that had the, nobody paid them any money. So that's why they were like out in the boondock somewhere. And we said to them, hey, you're so difficult to find. We want to pay you money. We funded them just to be able to figure out how to give us a contract. And so it was non-technical. It was really the legal framework. And my team and I determined to make the business work that really opened it up. Yeah, and then from there, other entrepreneurs come in. And Jason Njoku is an example. YouTube was there. So it wasn't technology, but he came and said, you know, it was a very difficult social maze that he had to be able to put together the business of being able to take the knowledge content and start to distribute it digitally on YouTube and then to build out his own platform and so on. If I think about the business that I'm doing now, Decagon, which is distribution of talent, right? Digital distribution of talent across the world. This is an industry that many countries have been doing for decades and it hasn't happened in Nigeria. There's no real technical reason why. It's just the gap, the entrepreneurship gap, media entrepreneurship and investment gap. So, so my, my belief then is that where you find, where there's like a founder opportunity, founder market fit, I guess you call it, that comes into the technology is already available. Um, of course, the technology has already been available. When the technology is not, not available, you run into the problem that I ran into with mobile internet. It was too early. 2G networks really was not a sufficient technology to support my bold idea. Um, so you need that foundation of technology capability. But then on top of that, you need that founder uh, market fit. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. I want to move it to a problem that's big on this side, especially because you came from pre-social media era to now the social media era. You've dealt with some high profile customer disputes and you have a high profile on Twitter and you have not been afraid to comment on very sensitive political issues. So as entrepreneurs that are listening to this, how have you wielded such a strong voice? Like where do you find that voice and what advice would you have for other entrepreneurs that want to do the same and have that voice on social media? Yeah, people play this differently. I'm very clear-minded. I have a philosophy that guides in Nigeria. I say, where do I put my mouth, right? <laughs> I don't put my mouth everywhere. I don't put my mouth just to share an idea, just for the sake of sharing an idea. Even if I have it, even if I think like, I like this or I don't like this, I think it's important to conserve my voice for things that I intend to do something about. So that's what guides me. But I want to try and be focused. So if I have then decided to like voice, put my mouth into a particular matter, then I'm also going to match it with action. And I think that also helps people take me seriously. For example, most recently, when I decided that I was, you know, really wanted to get on this technical mission I'm sure, to help software engineering industry, software engineering, for Nigeria to be like serious and real in software engineering, I realized that when governments or development agencies are talking about helping the Nigerian youth, it's mostly about agriculture. And then when they talk about increasing non-oil export revenue, then they're talking about mining, so agriculture, mining, manufacturing. But then it's a huge opportunity with digital skills. And it just, is, again, it's a quicker return on investment, it's a bigger return on investment. And so to get onto conversations, onto stages where that's the topic, I don't have to be invited. A couple of years ago, the Central Bank of Nigeria was talking about non oil export revenue and the youth and jobs. And I hustled to get on the panel. When I got there, I challenged them, they invited me to work with them. And I worked with them for about six months. And we created what is now a 22 billion naira fund to support the software engineering and creative industries. The, the thing about picking fights that I care about is that I don't care about losing. I don't care if I lose because I just think, okay, well, it was worth it. I knew it was worth it going in. 
Um, so I'm going to get in and make a noise. And even if I don't get what I really wanted, like at least I created some awareness and I just know it was worth it. My conviction gives me that confidence. You're a serial entrepreneur and you're a super angel. And like you said, founders are the, the key component of being able to tackle great opportunities in, in Africa. It's not the technology. It's going to be largely surrounding the founder. So how do you assess the risk of investing at the early stages, especially given that you have been across multiple markets? It's very important to not be too early. I think some of the things I touched on earlier. So, and, and if you think about like Steve Jobs, the way he would build products, it would be like, oh, he would only, he would only work on assembling technology that already and just needed to be put together um, in a elegant way. And like I've shared from my experience with uh, doing the internet and other things, like. I've done a lot of things where I was too early. So that's I'm very mindful of. It's very hard to build businesses in Africa. And so you wanna, I want to like not even bother with things where there's technical risk because there's, there's going to be business model risk, people risk, and so on. So that's one. It's, it has to be that the technology, and every technology is like there, it's solid, it's stable. So that's number one. Number two, I've passed on some deals that when I think back, Sometimes I think maybe I've been afraid that certain things look too easy and it has to be harder, like it has cost me. I don't want to say some of the companies. Uh, well, maybe I should since we're... Since yeah, exactly. Give us a shadow portfolio. Your, your, so, your biggest... So, so the one that hurts me the most is Paystack. Mm-hmm. Yeah, because I had known Shola for a few years. He was doing another company. You know, he ran out of school and he was doing another company they were building the software that was enterprise software. It was just, it was amazing stuff they were doing. So at the time, I wasn't interested in enterprise software, but I was really impressed with him. I had also hired his co-founder. At the time, I'd hired him as a CTO at Jobberman. So I knew both people and I had a lot of confidence in them. It just felt stripe and it just seemed like too easy. Like, it was like, the thing already worked. Um, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I just didn't get it. I mean, now it's so like obvious, but I don't get it like this. <laughs> so we've talked about some of the problems that entrepreneurs have in the past and how they dealt with them. One problem no entrepreneur could think of is a global pandemic. But these are the times that I think will show what a very strong entrepreneurial team would be. So I guess my question to you is, what are you talking to your teams about and what scenarios are you planning for to come out of this COVID crisis stronger? So we ran a full scenarios exercise. And Decagon's goal is not just to train software engineers for Nigeria or for Africa. You know, Decagon's goal is to build an engineering company that will be respected globally just for the quality of engineering. And like for to have the largest company in the world, I'd rely on Decagon for exceptional software engineering. Now, for that to happen, two things. One is that obviously demand for software engineering talent needs to continue. And second is that funding for edtech or distributed workforce. During these major global events, some segments just get a beating and some others do well. And in this scenario, in this current one, for sure, healthcare is hot. And the question is whether our segment is going to be hot and be able to continue to attract capital. And so we're playing some scenarios around that. And we're saying to ourselves, already our, our business model is a, is a capital efficient business model. We achieved cash flow positive after our first year. And so we said, let's be careful. First of all, we raised some money, which we hadn't done before, just to have some backup. And then we think people are firing engineers in different markets, but we're taking the assumption that is it's a temporary blip and that engineering hiring is going to continue because digital transformation is going to be accelerated. And so what we believe is now going to be different is that people will move from home to work from anywhere. If the engineer is not in the office in New York, or not in the office in, in Palo Alto, if he's in his house in Oakland, then he or she might as well be in Lagos or Enugu or Accra or Nairobi. So companies are going to want to get whatever the best is. 
And so now we're trying to figure out how to help companies see and discover the best in the places where we're very good at finding them and then helping them make that work. So this was always the plan. We're supposed to shift our focus from being very Nigeria-centric in, in the market that we serve to serving the world, maybe in year two or year three. We're doing it now because we believe that this COVID has created an opportunity for people to be not as geocentric in their sourcing of talent. So tell us about what's the next chapter for Decagon. And then if you can, tell us what's your favorite local snack. Decagon is really transitioning from discovery. So we spent a lot of time on discovering the top tier engineering talent in one market in Nigeria. And we're building on that. We've gotten very good at that. But now we're going to expand that discovery and sourcing to multiple markets. Of course, we're very Nigeria heavy, but we think the customer is the big companies that need the engineering talent at scale. And the big companies that need the engineering talent at scale want the best, wherever the best is. And so we are going to be really innovating and uh, innovating around ways that recruiters and engineering leaders around the world can find and onboard engineering talent whether that's full-time or for temporary projects. And we're going to be doing that in multiple markets. We already started to do that in America. We've started our pilot in Europe as well. And we're really looking to accelerate that this year. And we're building on things that we know that have worked. There are industries that have worked, staffing, recruiting. These industries have formats that work. But then it wiped everything away and said, rebuild these functions, rebuild these capabilities with the technical capabilities that are currently available and with the customer's preferences and customer needs that exist now. What would that look like? That's the question that we're trying to answer for enterprise customers across the world. So, you know, look out for some interesting things in that regard. In terms of my favorite snack, I don't know if, but whoever doesn't know Suya needs to discover suya. Americans might not consider a snack, but in Nigeria, we think, <laughs> we think of suya as a snack, right? And suya is basically really spicy. It's almost like a satay-ish type of flavor on the barbecue, beef, chicken, fish, uh, and so on. It's amazing. I can't believe that Nigeria hasn't made this popular all over the world. I agree. I agree. That's one of my favorites. Chica, we thank you for joining us today at Venture the World. We welcome you back after all this is over and you graduated your next cohort or you finished raising the round for Decagon on behalf of myself and the rest of the crew at Venture the World. We want to thank you for making the time to join us and sharing your journey with ourselves and the audience. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Chica. Thanks, Mark. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for being here. I learned a lot. Yeah, I can't wait to meet you in person. Hopefully after this coronavirus, we could do a video cast live and in person in Nigeria. Absolutely, absolutely. Looking forward to that. Three, two, one. Hey, everyone. Thanks for listening. To find more episodes, visit VentureTheWorld.com. You can follow us on Twitter or Instagram at VTW underscore HQ. If you enjoyed today's episode, please leave us a review, which will help other listeners like you venture the world. Thanks.